Good morning. Good morning, and on this gorgeous Sunday, welcome to the Guilford Community Church. Welcome to those who are watching right now on Facebook and later YouTube. If you are seated near the center of the aisle, please sign our registration book. And if you're not currently on the church email network and would like to be included, please sign your um, email when you sign in as well. Immediately following our service, um, coffee hour this morning is hosted by our membership committee. A special welcome to one of our favorite musicians, Mary Kay Robinson, this morning. We're just <laughs> delighted to have you here. And the flowers under the cross are dedicated by Linda Knightley in loving memory of her daughter's, daughter-in-law's father, Rob Kaiserman. And then just one other announcement. <clears throat> Thursday, we're having a potluck supper at 5 o'clock, followed by a program called Climate Up Close. And I, I love how it's described. Climate Up Close is a group of client, climate scientists who believe Americans should reach their own judgments about climate science by seeing the evidence for themselves and putting their questions directly to climate scientists. So if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you when you sign in this morning to say you want to come to the potluck, or you can call the church office or email Melissa. And I think that's it. Just take a moment to reflect on why we've gathered here today. Please stand 
and join me in our call to worship. We gather here to worship. To celebrate life's beauty and find healing for its pain. To listen for the wisdom that guides us. And then remain standing as we sing together hymn number 434, All Beautiful, The March of Days. Please be seated and join me in a word of prayer. We gather to this familiar place on this beautiful day, mindful that there are others who are part of this community who are scattered about in many different places. But wherever we find ourselves at this very, pla- at this very moment, it is a place made sec- sacred by our presence. So may we make the most of this day. May we live life with gratitude and kindness and a proactive generosity. Having received so much, may we live with open hearts and open hands and open minds. Praying these words while we remember the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago, a prayer that began, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
doesn't get much better than that, does it? And thank you for coming to church today, and you can go home now. That was probably... <laughs> I do have some people I'd ask you to keep in your thoughts, your prayers, and ask how you might respond to the situation. Uh, David Haley is down in serious condition at a hospital in Boston. We'll get a little update later this morning from Janet. And then our assigned scripture reading, uh, Grace Lepardo, yesterday had... Tremendous back pain and is waiting to get into that treated. So please keep grace in your thoughts and prayers. And then Deborah Kennedy Costner shared this morning that her sister in law, Sarah, uh, just quite unexpectedly lost her job after a number of years working there. And so I just ask you to hold her in your thoughts and prayers. So let us be now in a spirit of prayer. Every day we are bombarded with stories of how bad things are. And we know too well how easy it is to be overwhelmed, to feel worried and powerless, to see everything that is wrong, how easy it is to be paralyzed with fear. May this time together help us keep things in perspective. May we not overlook all that is good and right in our world, in our community, and in ourselves. We lift our voices in thanksgiving. We are grateful for the beautiful sounds that fill this place. We are blessed by those who love us enough to comfort us when we are wounded, and yet courageous enough to confront us when we are being destructive or just too negative. And we are grateful for this church, which despite its obvious imperfections has nurtured our spirits and raised our sights. And we give thanks too for our faith, a faith that sustains us, even when it doesn't have all of the answers, a faith that enriches life, empowers us, that allows us to embrace life's uncertainties, to live with a sense of purpose, and so as this prayer comes to an end, we know that thanks is too small a word, but we do join our voices and hearts and give thanks for all that is good in our lives and in our world, for truly, truly life is wonderful. Amen.
And now please stand as we sing together hymn number 419, Now Thank We All Our God. It's funny, or perhaps a better word would be, it's interesting how something random can trigger a memory and usher us back to a place we haven't been in years. Sometimes a smell will do that. Sometimes it's something we see. Maybe a song you hadn't heard in a long time does the trick. For me, it was a word that triggered that trek down memory lane. And the word was catalog. It ushered me right back to my childhood. When I was growing up, probably like most of you, I had parents who strongly believed in delayed gratification. (laughs) About the only time I got something special was on my birthday or Christmas and new clothes to start the school year. Other than that, not so much. I'm I'm guessing your childhood was a lot like mine. And my parents... They lived the same way. I don't ever remember seeing them buy random stuff for themselves. Nowadays, if I need something, I don't give it any thought. I pull my phone out and order it on Amazon, and a day or two later, it's in my mailbox. Delayed gratification has been replaced by instant gratification, and I'm not sure that's progress. But back in the day, I looked forward to the arrival of the Sears catalog. Came out twice a year. Later, they added a special Christmas edition. Sears was Amazon before Amazon and Walmart before Walmart. You could even order a house in the old Sears catalog, a house that Tom Meyerjurgen could probably assemble. Now, I have always hated shopping, but I loved 
flipping through the pages of the Sears catalog. My favorite section was the sports section. My, imagine, my imagination took over as I looked, pictures, looked at pictures of the latest baseball mitt. I could see myself behind home plate in my, with the new catcher's mitt, Rawlings catcher's mitt. Or the fish I'd catch with the latest Shakespeare fishing pole. And then there were hockey sticks, just like the one Gordy Howell used, and ice skates. I loved it. When I got a little older, I began to pay attention to the fall fashion for boys. And about the same time, there was another section of the catalog that became my focus. <laughs> Mom and Dad weren't around, that is. I'd linger and loiter for quite some time and daydream. But I hadn't thought about the Sears catalog in years. They stopped publishing it in 1993. But last week I needed something to read. and I was going through old books I had read on my Kindle, and I, I revisited a beautiful book. It's called The Way of Gratitude. It's by Galen Gingrich. He's the pastor of All Souls Unitarian Church in Manhattan. Now, Galen grew up Mennonite. And the book chronicles his exciting journey from what he describes as a very stifling religion, from the controlling con confines of a Mennonite faith to an expansive, liberating, empowering, world-affirming faith that he embraced as a Unitarian. Galen's faith honors science, but has room for mystery. He cherishes research and data and numbers, but he loves poetry. He understands what too few people understand, that religion is a human construct. Holy books didn't fall from the heavens, but they reveal what we think. And one of his practices is called the Catalog of Astonishment. And it was that word catalog that triggered that memory. But his Catalog of Astonishment is far more meaningful than any Sears catalog could ever have been. A Catalog of Astonishment doesn't peddle goods that will wear out or go out of fashion, but will help you sustain your sense of wholeness, fill you with joy and gratitude, it's a practice that helps him be rooted in the world. And his faith starts where all faith really starts, with a sense of astonishment. I love that. He writes, I'm astonished to be in a world which can contain such phenomenon as the nightingale singing in the darkness. And somehow that astonishment then reaches out to the fact that we exist at all that there's anything and not nothing, and that we are. For a little time, we're part of that. And we realize that ultimately life is a great and wonderful mystery, and that should take our breath away every time we remember that. Real religion always begins there, not with the threat of punishment or eternal damnation, but with awe and wonder and astonishment. That we're here at all. It begins with the recognition that it's gift and grace. So here's a question to think about today. When was the last time you were overwhelmed with a sense of astonishment? When was the last time you had your breath taken away from you? And what would you, what would you include in your catalog of astonishment? I'm astonished by serendipity. The fortuitous meeting I had with Cindy in the summer of 1978. I was at a restaurant. I don't know if they have them out here, but it's called Big Boys. When an old neighbor, Nancy McIsaac, I hadn't seen her in a four or five years, but she came and sat down with my buddies and me. And shortly after that, Cindy walked in with her friend Sandy didn't know Cindy and Sandy, but Nancy did. And they stopped at our table and chatted for a few moments. And then I began to make my plan <laughs> for asking her out. But who knows how life unfolds if I'm not there at that very moment, or she isn't, or Nancy isn't. Serendipity at play. 
And birth always astonishes me, especially the birth of my three children. That's a no-brainer. I'm amazed and astonished that somehow life grows inside a woman's body. So I'm grateful for the wonder of the human body. I'm grateful that I was privileged to watch our kids enter the world. But I'm even more thankful that men don't give birth. (laughs) And on the opposite end, being present when a person dies, believe it or not, makes my catalog of astonishment. One moment we're alive, the next not. What happens? What happens to the spark of life? No one really knows. Where does it go? But other things more ordinary make my list. The first time as an adult I went to the symphony, I was enveloped in the music. I felt like I was swimming in it or it was swimming through me. And then almost every morning this past week, right around 5.30, I've seen a fawn and her two does grazing on a Governor's Island salad bar buffet of leaves and grass and lichen. And every morning when they saw me, they were startled and they darted away. But yesterday, yesterday, they just looked up and then went back to their grazing. It was almost as if they said, you leave us alone and we'll leave you alone and all will be well in the world. And then this morning, I saw seven deer on Governor's Island, and I think they all got the memo. None of them scampered away, but simply went around about their business. I was slathered with grace. The sheer joy of being alive at that very moment was overwhelming. And then another entry in my catalog of astonishment happened at about 4.30 one day last week, or maybe a couple of weeks ago. I was up early to put air in my bike tires, and it was still dark. But a bird began its morning anthem, and I just listened. And then I echoed back my reply. And then I waited. Only silence. So I did it again. And then it responded, to which, and this went on for a little bit, it was a day baptized with sheer delight, wonder, and joy, having begun my day with a conversation and song with a a birdly neighbor of ours. Certainly, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, the world can be a truly enchanted, magical place. Another entry in my catalog of astonishment never ceases to take my breath away. When I used to start a run, or now a bike ride, it's almost always just a little bit dark. But at some point, suddenly, it gets light. And as, as my day is getting lighter, I realize that someone else on the other side of the world, their day is getting darker. The yin and yang of life reminding me of just how connected everything is. is. And then one day this last week, I was using my new electric lawnmower, cutting the grass. And I saw a little yellow butterfly with the most beautiful little orange dots on it. And it had a lunch date with one of our flowers. And I was just delighted that she or he has chosen our flowers for their daily serving of nectar. I I watched a wash in wonder and gratitude And then last Sunday, right before church started, my phone pinged. Got a text message from my grandkids. They're up in Maine for a week. But six-year-old, there's a picture of six-year-old Jax in his PJs, but he's got his feet in the lake. A big smile on his face. Children astonish easily, don't they? But it's an ability we seem to lose as we grow older. Then a few weeks earlier, when Jax was here, we went down to the little stream under the covered bridge. If you haven't gone down there, do it. 
And sheer delight filled his face from head to toe as he splashed and played in the water on a hot June afternoon. And just before we went back to the car, Cindy said, listen, it was the simple sound, the simple sound that water makes as it flows over the rocks. And if you have ears to hear, you know that's beautiful music. Maybe not quite as beautiful as the music we heard this morning, but pretty darn beautiful. I look at a sheet of music, and all I see are funny black things. But others, more gifted than me, they see the same thing and transform that into something mystical and moving and powerful enough to even make a cynical guy like me bend my knee in humble adoration. I'm on the same page as was poet Mary Oliver, who thought that praying and spirituality was simply a matter of paying attention, of keeping our eyes open, of living mindfully, living in the moment. And when you pay attention, you notice the butterfly. You hear the laughter of children. You notice the beautiful star-studded evening. But you also are aware that some things are as they shouldn't be, when the harmony of the world becomes discordant, when people who don't look like me are treated with less dignity than I am. You notice, too, how the system is tilted to put people like me, like most of us, at a slight advantage. And you know that something should be done. I'm astonished, too, at the amount of hatred and demonizing that is going on in our country. But I'm more astonished at the people who roll their sleeves up, step forward and say, enough is enough. They dedicate their lives to righting the world's wrongs. Because sadly, too often, I prefer the comfort. I prefer comfort to challenge, playing it safe rather than living courageously. So I'm inspired by all those people and some of you who work hard to make love visible in our community. And rather than cursing the darkness, you light candles. And so I'd love... It's only 1034, so we'll take the next 26 minutes. And you can write down all of your entries. But I would love, seriously, to hear your catalog of astonishment. Not only those things that take your breath away, but those things that deeply trouble you, that keep you awake at night. So let's continue to be grateful for all that we have and then work together that life, the good life we enjoy, might be possible for all others who share this planet with us. Amen. And now please stand as we close this service singing hymn number 563, We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky.
And now having gathered together for worship, may we go forth with a great sense of joy, purpose, and peace, knowing that we are partners. We are partners in creating a future free from want or fear. Amen.